All right, everybody, I want to go ahead and um, cover the lesson on procedural due process. You will recall uh, that procedural due process is a topic that is a part of uh, this concept, if you will, that, that we've been discussing called fundamental rights. Um, in thinking of procedural due process, procedural due process refers to the procedures, right? So just like the name sounds, it, it refers to the procedures that the government must follow before it deprives a person of life, liberty, or property, uh, i.e. those substantive fundamental rights that we've already discussed earlier uh, in this chapter. Now, you will recall that uh, substantive fundamental rights are, are a substantive due process focuses on whether the government has an adequate reason or uh, a sufficient justification, if you will, uh, for taking away a person's life, liberty, or property. So that's a, a, a good breakdown in terms of the distinguishment or the differences, if you will, of the uh, uh, or, or between rather procedural due process and substantive due process. When analyzing a procedural due process uh, question or issue, there is a, um, a fairly simple analytical framework to consider. Uh, so the first question that arises as we uh, consider um, a procedural due process question is, has there been a deprivation, right? Has something been taken away? Has some right been taken away? And, and the, the thing that the person has to be deprived of is uh, a vested interest or a vested right, right? And so has there been a de deprivation? Does the individual who has been deprived of something have a vested interest or vested right in the thing that they have been deprived of? That's a very important um, uh, question to ask as you consider whether there has been a deprivation. Second, is the deprivation a loss of life, liberty, or property? In other words, has the thing that the person, uh, has the thing that the person has been deprived of uh, uh, considered life, liberty, or property. And we'll talk about uh, how the court over time has determined what liberty is or what property is, right? And then the final question in an analytical framework of a procedural due process uh, issue is, is the deprivation without due process? Has the person that's been deprived of a right been deprived of that right without due process. And due process in this context means has the person been deprived of that right without notice or an opportunity to be heard? Has there been adequate notice? Has the person been notified sufficiently enough to know that they are going to be deprived of the right? Second, has there been a meaningful opportunity to be heard? Has that person who's been deprived of the right, had an opportunity to understand why they're being deprived of the right to begin with, right? And so that's very important to consider as you answer the question, is there a deprivation without due process? Keep in mind that we are talking about, even in this context, that the deprivation has to be by a state actor. So it has to be state action. And a couple of the cases that we'll talk about uh, will, will help you guys understand the distinguishment between state action and private action, okay? So uh, in the context of the first question, has there been a deprivation? The first thing um, that uh, our text uh, talks about is, uh, or, or considers a, a deprivation from is in the context of negligence, right? So generally speaking, negligence is insufficient to create a deprivation. There must be an intentional or at least a reckless government action. And the first case that considers this issue of whether uh, negligence can be determined uh, uh, as a deprivation is the case of Daniels versus Williams. Daniels held that 
negligence is insufficient for a deprivation under the due process clause. Why? Where in the due process clause is there a state of mind requirement? And so as you read over Daniels, you will recall that that was a case where um, uh, the petitioner sued under uh, section 1983 uh, for injuries that he sustained while he was an inmate at a correctional institution. He claimed uh, that a deputy had left a pillow in a stairwell and that he slipped and fell on the stairwell or in the stairwell because of this pillow. And so um, the court determined that the due process clause in that case that was not impl uh, implicated by a negligent act of an official causing unintended loss of or injury to life, liberty or property. The key word there is unintended. The court noted that the guarantee of due process should be applied to deliberate decisions. Deliberate here means intentional, right? Deliberate decisions of governmental officials uh, to deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. In this case, this provision uh, the court notes that this provision of the due process clause is designed to protect against arbitrary exercises or abuses of power by the government and to supplant traditional tort law. So in other words, if uh, negligence rises to the, the position that there has been a deprivation, that negligence has to be intentional. It has to be in the construct of the action that's been taken, a deliberate indifference, right, to uh, uh, the individual's rights, or in this case, to the inmate's rights. Um, similarly, you have a question of, uh, of, of whether the state uh, could be uh, held uh, uh, responsible for a depri deprivation of, uh, of a right based on negligence in the County of Sacramento versus Lewis case. In that case, um, essentially that, that, that case uh, stood for the point that uh, emergency circumstances uh, or for emergency circumstances, the government's conduct must shock the conscience. This means that um, officers must act with the intent of causing harm to victims. You'll recall in, uh, in Lewis, that a young man uh, ultimately lost his life after he was um, uh, hit by a deputy while, while fleeing uh, 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 an alleged crime scene, right? And in arriving at this, this standard of shocking the conscience, the court noted that um, in, in circumstances like, like the issue that had been presented in Lewis, only a purpose to cause harm unrelated to the legitimate object of arrest would satisfy the element of arbitrary conduct shocking to the conscience for uh, that was necessary for a due process violation. So in other words, again, uh, in Lewis, the, the, the court uh, uh, stuck to or, or held fast to that standard that they had established in Daniels of saying, look, the, the government action has to be intentional, right? It has to be purposeful. Um, uh, in order to, to satisfy the element that arbitrary uh, 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 conduct uh, exists, right? That arbitrary conduct has to shock the conscience, right? So that shocking of the conscience means that is so egregious, is, is, is so intentional that uh, that's the only way that it could rise to the level of negligence. The, the, the court determined in Lewis that uh, in that particular case, the high speed chases that that had no intent to harm suspects physically or to worsen their legal plight did not give rise to um, a due process clause violation under the 14th Amendment. And in Lewis, the court again established this uh, shocks the conscience test and, and determined that while the officer may have been reckless, uh, in making a poor decision to uh, um, uh, initiate this, this high-speed chase or this high-speed pursuit, um, <clears throat> there wasn't any evidence that he acted with an improper or malicious motive. And as a result, 
the uh, the officer's actions did not shock the conscience to the to amount to a due process violation. Notice in that case that the court implies that if there is an opportunity for reflection, deliberate indifference is the test. And again, anytime you have uh, 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 challenges to uh, to uh, government action that uh, implicates or, or is filed under a 1983 type of an action, uh, 40, 42 U.S.C. 1983 is the particular statute, the, the, the government's action must rise to deliberate indifference. And so what the court is essentially asking is um, when, uh, or, or I guess a takeaway to, 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 to the deliberate indifference standard is when are, the, when are there circumstances for reflection? When is it sufficient for instances like this to constitute um, an emergency? If you think about this deliberate indifference standard, has the court really articulated uh, a test that's, that's virtually impossible to meet? Rarely it would seem that it can be shown that, uh, that officers or any type of law enforcement officers act with intent to cause harm to a victim. So something to think about when, when considering the, the, deliberate in, uh, the deliberate indifference standard. Another instance of this question of whether there has been a deprivation is when does the do uh, when does the government have a duty, if at all, right, <clears throat> to protect people from privately inflicted harms? In other words, when does a deprivation occur in in the respect of a, a harm that's been privately uh, inflicted as opposed to one a harm that's been inflicted by by the state or by the government? Uh, and this was the question that the case of the Shaney versus Winnebago County uh, Department of Social Services answered. Uh, in that particular case, Joshua DeShaney was a four-year-old boy who uh, had been severely beaten by his father. And as a result of this abuse, he suffered irreparable or irreversible brain damage. There had been a number of complaints over time or really over the course of two years to, uh, to the local uh, DSS or Department of Social Services um, regarding this abuse, yet no action had been taken to protect the boy. And so uh, a suit was filed against the county uh, by uh, the, the boy's mother after he, he, uh, he suffered uh, uh, a tremendous uh, uh, setback, if you will, that, that essentially said that the county's inaction had result, resulted rather uh, in a loss of liberty uh, without due process. Ultimately, in other words, this abuse left the little boy uh, uh, confined for life to an institution for the profoundly retorted, retarded rather, such that he had to have care for the rest of his life. And so as a result of that, his mother uh, sued the DSS for their inaction um, uh, in stepping in, despite having noticed that uh, this abuse was taking place. Um, and so the question uh, was, was in that case was whether uh, the Department of Social Services in their failure to remove the young boy from the home when they had been alerted to this presence of this abu abuse, deprived the child of his liberty in violation of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And the court stated no, right? The court uh, held that a state's failure to protect an individual against private violence simply does not constitute a violation under the due process clause. The court noted that there was nothing in the language of the due process clause that required the state to protect life, liberty, or property of citizens against invasion from or by uh, 
private actors. Rather, the due process clause, as we already know, was designed to protect citizens from abuse of power by the government or uh, acts of oppression by the government, right? Not private individuals. As So as a result, the court basically determined that the due process clause was not designed to protect citizens from one another. So we, we are left with um, an unfortunate result in this case though, right? So when you think about it at a minimum, shouldn't the government have some responsibility where it is the only possible protection? You have a situation where the government was at least put on notice, not once, not twice, but multiple times, right? Over the course of a two year period, to this, uh, to this alleged abuse. How how else is a four year old child uh, um, left to 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 defend himself? You know, shouldn't he uh, have received some sort of protection from the government when the government was put on notice? If you think back, and if you were uh, 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 aware of or abreast of. Uh, current events here in, in the recent past, you see a similar situation or a similar set of circumstances that occurred in the state of Louisiana, where you had on several different occasions, children dying uh, from uh, unintentional drug overdoses uh, while in their parents' uh, custody or control after the um, the State Department of Child Protective Services had been put on notice that there was either the presence of drug abuse in the home or something that was out of line uh, that the child should have received uh, protection. So why not, uh, one could argue, uh, create an affirmative duty on the government to protect people from privately inflicted harms, at least where the government has the power and ability to do so, right? And, and this would be uh, a great example of that when you are um, uh, considering children, right, who um, rely obviously on their parents for protection, but when their parents are either the abusers or their parents are the ones who are uh, addicted to uh, controlled substances, who is left to protect the child, right? Something to think about uh, in that context of whether there has been a deprivation. Nevertheless, we see that underlying, the underlying result or the underlying opinion rather in DeShaney is this powerful notion that the constitution is negative uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, prohibiting, as a mechanism, prohibiting government, not affirmative, right? Meaning that the government has a duty to act in the, the, the circumstances of, uh, of private wrongs that are being um, uh, uh, in, in implemented, for lack of a better term. So with that in mind, what about or how do we know uh, uh, when there is a, or when the deprivation is life, liberty, or property, right? Um, <clears throat> is the deprivation, this is the second part of our analysis of a procedural due process question. Is the deprivation a loss of life, liberty, or property? And so this question arises um, <clears throat> of whether there is a deprivation of life, liberty, or property in terms of how those three things are defined. How does one define life, liberty, or property? Over time, the court has recognized the difficulty in defining what constitutes a property or a liberty interest, right? When you think about it, defining uh, uh, or, or understanding when one is deprived of life is easy to recognize. It's not so so simple to determine when one is deprived of liberty or when one is deprived of a property interest. Up until the late 60s, Smarinsky notes that uh, the Supreme Court drew a distinction between rights and privileges for the purposes of a due process analysis. Property or liberty interests 
were implicated when rights were taken away, but not if privileges were taken away. Uh, and so Shimarinsky talks about um, um, scholarly research and work that had been uh, conducted by Professor Charles Reich. Uh, that argued that this rights privileges distinction was an anachronism of the time, right? In an era where people had become dependent on the government for so much uh, that was essential for their own survival, right? Government benefits like education, uh, welfare, and social security in, in Professor Wright's uh, uh, assessment held the same place in a person's life as a property um, uh, traditionally occupied, right? Thus, these, these things, this, this, this access to, or this uh, uh, privilege, if you will, to, uh, to education or right, uh, I'm sorry, or welfare or social security benefits, uh, th this new property, if you will, um, um, was one that that due process should be provided for whenever the government sought to terminate access to these rights. So as a result of this, different ways of defining property emerged. One way was that uh, a property right exists if it's important to the individual. And we see that as being the case in, um, in the case of Goldberg versus Kelly, which we'll talk about in a second. The alternative approach is that property exists if government gives reasonable expectation to the continued receipt of a benefit. That was the approach that was taken in the Board of Regents versus Roth. So uh, let's, let's talk about the first, the first uh, way, if you will, of defining property, right? Uh, a property right exists if it is important to the individual. The key case uh, for recognizing privileges as requiring due process is the case of uh, uh, Goldberg versus Kelly. Goldberg versus Kelly answered the question of whether termination of uh, public assistance payment public assistance payment by the state to a particular recipient without affording, affording that uh, recipient an opportunity for an evidentiary hearing prior to the termination of those rights, whether this termination deprived the person of due process in violation of the 14th Amendment. And in Goldberg, the court determined that, yes, it did. The court noted that when welfare is discontinued, only a pre-termination evidentiary hearing provided the recipient with procedural due process. So again, think back to how we define what procedural due process uh, uh, was, right? The, 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 the process uh, or the procedures, right, that the government must follow before depriving a person of a right um, uh, uh, or uh, uh, a substantive fundamental right, i.e. before depriving a person of life, liberty, or property, right? And so uh, Goldberg noted that for recipients of welfare, uh, welfare provides the means to obtain the essentials of life, right? Food, clothing, housing, medical care. Termination uh, pending resolution of entitlement to these benefits may deprive an eligible recipient of the very means by which to live while that person waits, right? And so this, this notion of an individual's right to welfare, to be able to have access to those things that they need without a, a, a pre-termination evidentiary hearing were uh, uh, was was extremely important. The court noted that the state's interest in uh, conservation of uh, its fiscal and administrative resources by uh, a summary adjudication, if you will, were not overriding in the welfare context. Why? Because states have other ways of minimizing costs, such as streamlining the pre-termination hearing process. So in other words, <clears throat> 
have a, a procedure uh, or, or mechanism in place before terminating the, the, the benefits. And if need be, if, if your concern as the state is making sure that uh, your, your fiscal and administrative resources are conserved, have a streamlined process in order to bring that to pass. That was the court's uh, uh, conclusion in Goldberg versus Kelly. What process is due? Uh, well, the court noted that in, in, in Goldberg, it, the, the process that was due did not have to be uh, a judicial trial or a quasi-judicial trial, but it does need to be at, 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 at a meaningful, uh, held at a meaningful time and in a meaningful manner. The court also noted that a recipient must also have timely and adequate notice that detail the reasons for the proposed termination and an effective opportunity to defend the termination by confronting any adverse witnesses and by presenting his own arguments and evidence orally. So an interesting distinction between rights and privileges, right, um, that was set out in Goldberg. However, we see uh, sort of an about face, if you will, when that question comes up in the case of Board of Regents versus Roth, where the court said um, that it was no longer following this rights versus privileges distinction, right? In Roth, you had the situation where a professor uh, who was under a one-year contract had his, his contract terminated prior to his um, uh, attaining or acquiring tenure. Um, prior to his termination of his contract, he, he received notice uh, from uh, the, the, the school where he taught uh, that his contract would not be renewed. And he sued in federal court alleging that the decision not to rehire him infringed on his 14th Amendment due process rights. The court determined no, though, that it did not. Why not? The court noted in Roth that in order to have a protected property interest, a person clearly must first have more than an abstract need or desire for it. You already see the distinction, right, between what the court or how the court is considering this right in Roth to how the court considered that right to welfare in Goldberg. In Roth, the court noted that the person must have more than a unilateral expectation of the right. He must have a legitimate claim of entitlement to it. In this case, the court noted that Roth had no such entitlement. His contract was for one year and specifically stated that it would end at the end of that time period with no promises of renewal. Uh, uh, and as a result, Roth was not entitled to any pre-deprivation hearing because he had no interest to which he was entitled. He had just as much of an opportunity to go out and find another job and had a sufficient amount of time between the time he was notified of the termination of his contract and when the contract would end in order to go out and find another job, right? And so you see the court refuses to uh, maintain, if you will, uh, uh, this, this uh, distinction at that time uh, between rights and privileges, right? And so uh, you, you see, uh, again, this, this, this breakdown as you consider, you know, um, uh, whether this deprivation uh, or, or how um, uh, the deprivation of property is defined, you see these two distinctive ways that that uh, property is defined, right? You have a property right that exists uh, if it's important to an individual, right? Which was the, the actual case um, um, in Goldberg. And then second, you have uh, this alternative approach, if you will, uh, if property exists um, uh, or that property exists if government gives a reasonable expectation to continue uh, receipt of a benefit. So we see that as being the case 
So um, what about in instances, if you will, um, of, uh, of, of, of how liberty is defined, right? What is liberty and how, do, how, does, how does the court define liberty? Well, uh, the, the court actually uses the same two approaches that it used in defining property to, de to define liberty. The court looked at the importance of the interest at stake, as well as uh, it looked to determine if something in state law created an expectation in the, in the individual uh, that the right or interest would continue, right? And so we consider uh, these questions in, um, in uh, regarding is there a deprivation of liberty in the cases of Goss versus Lopez and uh, Paul versus Davis. First, um, in, in considering the, the question of liberty in Goss, um, the court considered there or the facts in Goss looked at uh, uh, students who were suspended from school and brought a suit uh, alleging that they had been uh, denied their procedural due process rights because they were not allowed an opportunity uh, either pre or post suspension to challenge this punishment. And so you have a situation um, uh, where the court noted uh, that that students had um, um, uh, 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 legitimate claims uh, because entitlement to public uh, uh, education was in fact uh, a property interest based on Ohio state law. Um, <clears throat> however, the court, or, or, or additionally rather, in that case, the court noted that uh, there was this uh, uh, liberty interest in one's good name, reputation, honor, or integrity. And so as a result, the court determined that due process did in fact apply here. And as a result, the school could not suspend the students uh, without adhering to the minimum procedures that were required by the due process clause. What procedures then were required? Well, the court noted in the case of Goss that due process required that the student be given either oral or written notice of the charges against him and if he denies them, an explanation as to uh, what evidence authorities had uh, and an opportunity to present his side of the story. And so the, the, the key takeaway from Goss is that you see the court recognizes uh, or notes a liberty interest in a person's good name, reputation, honor, or integrity. Uh, the, Goss was decided in 1975. A year later, the court does an about face and rejects this liberty interest in one's reputation uh, that was alluded to in Goss when it considered the question in the case of Paul versus Davis. Um, in, in that case, uh, a law enforcement officer distributed uh, flyers to uh, 800 local businesses to make them aware or to alert them of potential shoplifters during the Christmas shopping season. And these flyers identify specific potential shoplifters. They had uh, mug shots on the flyers of several people. And a, a mug shot of one individual, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Davis in this case, was included. He had been arrested um, uh, a, a year earlier and arraigned on, on a crime, but he had not been prosecuted. And after the flyer with his mugshot on it was circulated, these charges that had been pending against Davis were dismissed. And so the question that the court considered was whether Davis had a liberty interest protected by the 14th Amendment in not having his name and face disparaged to local businesses. And the court noted that he did not. The court noted in, in arriving at his conclusion that the 14th Amendment did not, in terms, single out reputation as a candidate for special protection 
over and above other interests that could be protected by state law. While, while there was a drastic effect of the stigma, right, that resulted from defamation by the government in other contexts, uh, and, and those, those uh, instances had been recognized in conjunction with other more tangible interests, nevertheless, this, this reputation uh, or, or effect of the stigma on one's reputation was not recognized as a liberty or property interest by itself. The court noted that Davis's remedy in this case uh, was in tort law to seek damages for his injury, not in the Constitution. So you see the court do an about face on uh, on the question of whether a person's reputation uh, could be considered a liberty interest uh, between Goss, its decision in, in, in Goss in 1975 and its decision in, in Paul versus Davis in 1976. Um, very briefly, Shemarinsky talks about uh, or considers this, this liberty interest for prisoners. And he notes that uh, a liberty interest exists for prisoners only if there is a significant deprivation of freedom that is not typical to the usual conditions of confinement. The, the court no longer finds uh, uh, a liberty interest for prisoners in statutes and revocation. I, I'm sorry, regulations. Uh, the court did talk about or has noted that the revocation of parole and or probation is a deprivation of a liberty interest that requires procedural due process. Prior decisions found this particular interest tied to an individual's personal freedoms. However, later decisions uh, like, like the decision uh, uh, that, that Shimarinsky notes of Greenholz versus um, the in, inmates of Nebraska Penal and correctional complex found that the liberty interest existed only if state law makes it so using mandatory language in its applicable state law. Uh, another liberty interest that has been determined uh, to exist is that of good time credits. The court has noted that a prisoner may have an interest in good time credits when awarded under state law, which created expectations on the part of the prisoner. So again, that expectation to a particular right um, uh, comes up in the question. And, and the court has noted that good time credits uh, is such that prisoners have a created expectation in. The court has also noted that prisoners have a liberty interest in being free from the involuntary administration of psychotropic drugs. And that that uh, particular interest was recognized in the case of Washington versus Harper. Now, we've answered the first two questions of the procedural due process analytical framework. The first question, remember, was what? <clears throat> I can hear you guys thinking through it, right? or at least articulating it. Let, let my, uh, so now my, my slide show has, has run away. Let's start it over again. Okay. So remember uh, when we initially uh, talked about our uh, analytical framework of procedural due process, we had three questions. The first, has there been a deprivation, right? So we, we looked at that with some depth and consider what that means. And again, if there's a deprivation, the question uh, that's uh, 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 implicated is, does the individual have a vested interest or right in the thing that he has allegedly been deprived of? The second question is, is the deprivation a loss of life, liberty, or property, right? And so we just talked about uh, uh, what what is implicated there? How has the court over time come to define property and or liberty? And so now we have we arrived at our third question, and that is, uh, has the deprivation been 
without due process. Another way of, of, uh, of asking that question is, um, uh, uh, what procedures, right, are required when the court is depriving an individual of a right? And so remember, we, we answer that question by answering the questions, has there been adequate notice and has there been a meaningful opportunity to be heard? So in considering the question of um, uh, um, has there been or, or, or what, what procedures uh, are required or, or the third prong, if you will, uh, 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 of, of our procedural due process analysis, when the government is required to provide due process, it essentially must provide or must supply some basic safeguards, right? Those safeguards include um, adequate notice of the charges are issued, right? That, that is, is being addressed. Uh, an opportunity for a meaningful hearing meaning meaningful time and in a meaningful manner and an impartial decision maker as it relates to the issue, right? However, depending on the deprivation, then notice that is required differs, meaning that notice could be uh, personal service, notice could be by mail, Notice could be by posting on the door. It just depends on what right that the person is being deprived of uh, that implicates the type of notice that is required. Also, the kind of hearing varies as well. It could be a pre-deprivation hearing or post-deprivation hearing, depending on the interest that is involved. And the decision maker as well also varies, right? It could be a judge. It could be a hearing officer. So it just depends, right? The case of Matthews versus Eldridge is, is key in helping to navigate those questions. In Matthews, the court articulated a balancing test, right? For deciding what procedures are required when there has been a deprivation of life, liberty, or property, and due process is required. The Supreme Court has applied this particular balancing test repeatedly in deciding what process is due. So in, uh, in, in Matthews versus Eldridge, Mr. Eldridge began receiving his social security benefits in June of 1968. Four years later, in, in, uh, or roughly four years later, in March of 1972, the state agency that administered the, the disability benefits program sends Mr. Eldridge a questionnaire regarding his continued disability status, uh, inquiring among other things about his medical sources, including uh, physicians from whom he had uh, recently received treatment. Uh, Mr. Uh, Eldridge re re responds to this questionnaire. The agency then uses the questionnaire to obtain reports from Eldridge's healthcare providers um, uh, that, that, that he used in answering those questions. And after considering the reports that were supplied by Eldridge's healthcare providers, the agency made a tentative de determination to discontinue Eldridge's disability benefits. They also gave him reasons as to why they were arriving at that conclusion. Eldridge was given an opportunity to respond and submit additional information pertaining to his condition. And so in his uh, written response, he disputed the way that the, the agency characterized his condition and said that the information that he had already provided was sufficient evidence uh, of his continued disability. Nevertheless, uh, the agency, uh, after receiving this particular uh, uh, response from Eldridge, noted that its final uh, determination had been made and gave him notice that his disability would cease in May of 1972. By uh, July of 1972, 
uh, the federal Social Security Administration accepted this particular determination and sent Eldridge notice that his benefits would stop after that month and notified him that he could seek reconsideration within the following six months. So as a result, Eldridge filed suit. Now, we have a situation where uh, uh, Eldridge has been deprived of this right. There's some uh, conversation and discussion going back and forth, notifying him that he would be deprived of this right based on information that he supplies. Um, uh, they allow him an opportunity to justify or, or uh, 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 reconcile the information that, that they had obtained from his medical providers with his response to that information. Nevertheless, they still terminate his benefits. And so the court considers the question of whether Mr. Eldridge's due process uh, rights under the Fifth Amendment required an evidentiary hearing prior to termination of the benefits he received from the Social Security Administration. And the court noted that no, uh, there was no requirement for a pre-termination hearing. No evidentiary hearing was required uh, prior to termination of Eldridge's disability benefits. And the present administrative procedures fully comported with due process. The court found that the deprivation in this case was less than that in Goldberg, where the court determined that a pre-termination hearing uh, prior to uh, terminating welfare benefits was necessary. Remember that case. In this case, um, the court noted that the disabled worker, worker has potential other sources of temporary income, right, such as welfare, such as family support from other workers in the household, etc. Thus, something less than an evidentiary hearing was sufficient prior to adverse administrative action. The present procedure, the court noted, was adequate where uh, the decision to terminate was based on medical information from the recipient's own medical file and physician statements, right? And the recipient was given access to all of this information that had been considered prior to termination of the benefits. And the recipient was afforded an opportunity to submit additional evidence and arguments to challenge a preliminary, uh, the preliminary decision. So the court looked at the, the comprehensive process and noted that there was more than enough of an opportunity um, that existed for Eldridge to respond that uh, regarding these particular rights that did not necessitate a pre-termination hearing. The court instituted uh, in Matthews, or in this particular case, this balancing test for deciding what procedures were uh, required by the due process clause. Those, uh, those three things were stated as such. The private interest that will be affected by the official action must be considered. The second thing, the risk of an erroneous deprivation of such interest through the procedures used and the probable value, if any, of additional or substitute procedural safeguards. And then finally, the public or the government interest, if you will, including the function involved and the fiscal and administrative burdens that the additional or substitute procedural requirement would entail. So this was this balancing test that the court instituted um, uh, and, and, and relied upon in deciding what procedures were required under the due process clause. So be certain to highlight this, this test or these three things uh, in your case notes or in your reading of, of the brief, uh, if you will, or of the case rather of Matthews versus Eldridge, right? Now, finally, uh, to, to uh, conclude our discussion on uh, procedural due process rights, Shimarinsky briefly notes, what is the relationship between 
substantive due process and procedural due process. Again, what is the relationship between substantive due process and procedural due process? Well, that question was answered in the case of the district attorney's office for the third judicial district versus Osborne, relatively um, a recent case in 2009 that considered the issue of whether a convicted felon had a substantive freestanding right to DNA evidence untethered from the liberty interest he hoped to vindicate with this right. So in, uh, in this particular case, uh, in the state of Alaska, uh, two individuals, Jackson and Osborne, had been convicted of kidnapping, assaulting, uh, kidnapping rather, assault and sexual assault of an individual. Um, uh, a blue condom that had been found at the location where this individual uh, was said to have been uh, uh, assaulted contained DNA that, uh, when tested, used a particular method that excluded Jackson, but not Osborne. And so Osborne had the same genotype matching from this particular sample, but, and here's the catch, so did 16% of the Black population. Now, obviously, Osborne uh, is Black. Osborne, uh, Osborne right, right as, a, as a part of his post-conviction relief, sought to have a more definitive DNA test performed on this particular sample, but was denied this right. And uh, uh, this request denial, if you will, was the basis of this particular uh, uh, suit. So the court determined that Mr. Osborne did not have the right or the substantive freestanding right to this particular evidence. The court noted that there was nothing in our nation's history that recognized such a right. Its very novelty is the reason or is reason enough to doubt that substantive due process sustains the right. Uh, a very, when you think about it, a tenuous decision. And this, this, the, the, the tenuousness, if you will, of the decision was noted by the dissent. <clears throat> the dissent was, was very clear that, that Osborne did, in fact, have a liberty interest in his physical freedom. And this particular liberty interest was obviously constitutionally significant. That interest would be vindicated by providing post-conviction access to DNA evidence uh, as with the state's interest, right, uh, in ensuring that it punished the true perpetrator of the crime. And so both parties had uh, a, a very uh, uh, important interest in allowing Osborne to be able to access this DNA evidence. The, the dissent noted that the state had no countervailing interest that overrides Mr. Osborne's interest in this DNA test. Uh, and as a result, it was the, def the defense position that the state's failure to provide Mr. Osborne with this test at his own expense, mind you, was an arbitrary action that offended due process. So uh, that, that case uh, uh, is, is a good example of this, of this balance, if you will, or this consideration of the relationship uh, between the substantive due process, right, right, the, 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 this, this, this reason or this sufficient justification of taking away uh, a person's life, liberty, or property, balancing that with the procedural due process question. When must uh, the government uh, provide uh, an individual notice and a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Thus, uh, this uh, concludes our consideration and discussion of procedural due process. Make sure that you uh, underscore uh, these approaches that we have discussed in this module, uh, talking about our analytical framework of procedural due process, recalling again that the way that we approach uh, 
uh, procedural due process question is first by answering the question, has there been a deprivation? If so, is the deprivation a loss of life, liberty, or property, right? And is the deprivation without due process? Meaning, has there been adequate notice and has there been a meaningful opportunity to be heard? I appreciate you guys' attention and we will uh, talk about uh, other constitutional issues that come up as we get back together in class. I appreciate it again. You guys have a good one.